Welcome back. Welcome back to a another live stream of Bayesian Cognitive Modeling, where I go through all of the exercises um, in order to learn about how to conduct Bayesian inference within the cognitive sciences. Um, last time we were working on the psychophysics, or yeah, psychophys example, where we were doing a traditional psychophys task and we were seeing if we could identify people's yeah, there we go. that's the term just noticeable differences so we wanted to know um, at w at which point or to which point does the probability of choosing resp or identifying a difference in response um, where does that lie on the curve and uh, for a given individual um, and in this case, we're talking about specifically sound, so at duration. So if we presented a subject with two uh, stimuli simultaneously and one beep was, say, 300 milliseconds, and then the second beep was 300 to and upwards milliseconds, um, at what point in the difference between the two beeps would a subject be able to perceive that difference um, so this task helps us capture what that what that point looks like for a given individual um, and then also allows us to to model or predict what the probability of observing a difference would be for a given stimulus intensity um, for a given subject so that's what we did here for the first example and now we're going to be moving into adding additional sorts of, like many examples that we've done in this book so far, we're going to add like additional bells and whistles to the example where we were just interested in looking at um, the psychophysical process or, or psychological process um, using the experimental data. But now we're going to introduce some additional sources of error or variability that might impact your ability to infer uh, given individuals just noticeable differences um, point and so we're going to talk about contamination which you know I did like we're of norm in the series where I'm, I'm just going to learn as we go here and we'll talk through the example about what contamination is and um, what it means in the context of this problem and then how what are some common or what are these solutions that we can introduce into our implementation strategy of the psychophysical model in order to combat uh, contem uh, the impact of contamination um. all right so that's what we're going to do today i am real excited let's just get right into it then i'm just going to set up some music for myself here so bumping because I can't hear the music you guys can the chill the sort of chill vibe music in the background Tickets. There we go. There we go. Okay.
Mm-hmm. All right. Experimental data are rarely a clean reflection of the process of interest, as we were. Um, and that's clear from what we saw yesterday, right? Where we saw for some subjects, um, you know, we couldn't get a, a good read on the just noticeable difference, in part because of the influence of potential outliers on the estimation of this prediction um, curve or psychophysical function curve. All right. So in for example, then, attentional losses can produce con containment, containment data that affects inference. This means that it's a good idea to account for these contaminants explicitly. So we're going to talk about accounting for contaminants explicitly using mixed and round approach. Okay. To deal with potential contaminants. So we're just going to introduce an additional specification in the model in order to account for potential contaminants, such as, in this case, I think attentional lapses is what we'll be interested in. Okay. So for the given subject for some stimulus pair, um, we'll have a binary variable, uh, which determines what type of response we're looking at. So when zero responses here, are generated from the psychophysical function with the parameters just as before. But with the indicator, the mixture indicator is one, then we would assume that the responses generated are from a different success rate. So there's this underlying um, process that might be at work that is responsible for some of the patterns of responses within our model. And we want to be able to account for that. So we introduce this additional parameter here. So so instead of the success rate associated with the uh, parameterization for a given response when someone is um, properly doing the task, we can also have this rate where we set a prior distribution, uh, a uniform prior distribution, and we specify some probability of this contaminant behavior occurring on any stimulus. So it's a way to introduce in uncertainty into our model where you know, it's possible that not every response that we observe is actually reflective of the actual data generating process but it could be the case that there's some um, probability that any given response is representative of a different data generating data generating process and so we just want to explicitly say well at how much of the total trials generated here are a part or likely to be part of a different generating process than that of what we are interested in. And um, this Zeeb indicator is going to help us uh, parse apart which of the trials should contribute to the parameters of interest, in this case, alpha and beta, for our LOJ models. So... We're going to use a probit transformation and a Gaussian distribution on the group level. So we can pull up the code for this, but let's just take a look at it. And I think the first thing to do is just kind of, well, how does it differ from the other model? So here's the other model. Just briefly, I'll hold here. You can see we're modeling averages for the two terms for each subject. And now here, in addition, now notice how the plates are shifted here where we still have these two terms for each subject, but it also might be the case that there's a probability that where the success rate is this. 
Right, so when Z is one, I think that's what the code means. Let's see. All right, when this value is one, then it's likely this value is the data generating process. But when it's zero, it's possible. It's then these two. And the probability of this being one or zero has a data generating process of mu and sigma on the group level. So there's this overarching expectation and spread associated with the a probability of it being a given trial for a given individual being representative of One sec, strain. We're getting there. All right, where were we? So, like we were saying, this Z, this Z indicator is going to tell us if the data generating process or the probability of the data generating process for a given interval for a subject is representative of the psychophysical function or some other process like attentional lapse is what it described right so some process that is related to some potential contaminant mechanism also at work when people are doing these sorts of tasks Let me open up this model then. So, same working directory, and I'm just going to close out some of these from last time. And we're looking at. Psychophysical 2. Oops. If this runs, Error.
I see. We got something that's broken here. Hmm. I'm just going to try to run the stand model. And then using the, the stand model, we'll try to run through the examples then. I might have changed something yesterday. some parser it doesn't look like anything's broken per se but we might crash here because we have so many uh, potentially deprecated assignment operators we're using in our stand code it's old code um, we'll see if we can get this to implement at least so let's walk through here's the uh -oh. validate but must be. Oh, we might have broke it. This happened to me yesterday or the other day. It's going to go through every iteration in the chain. It's going to notice that one of the. Yep. Stand code's not working either. Oh, nice reset.
When monitoring multidimensional variables such as z, JAGS requires that they are completely specified. We use a trick here and specify z slight to be slightly larger than the maximum and then adjust the model file to add 999 to the superfluous numbers. This is anything but pretty, so please let us know if you find a more elegant solution. Looks like I just restarted the R and we're okay. So the output then we're going to get intercepts and slopes for each of the subjects and then we're also going to get let's see ij so for each subject for each trial we're going to get the probability of that given interval being a interval that's from the um, psychophysical data generating process or some other data generating process. So it looks like we're getting quite a substantial number of the trials. So four, trial 22, as you recall too, if we looked at here, I bet that that's like this trial. Seven, two. You see, for some trials, we get this absurdly large value. And this is part of the specification trick that was used for implementing this sort of latent indicator in a JAGS model. So, I mean, we'll, we'll explore more of that, but we're just taking a, a general look at some of the, what it's, the how to interpret some of these results. So each of these are then, like we said, probabilities of 
being part of one group or another and i will assume that these 999 cases are reflective of definitely not being part of the data generating process Let's look at the trace plots. I need to look at trace plots more, so I'm just gonna. So here, nicely mixed for alphas. It looks like we'll have the trace plots for each of the subjects. Eight, you can see eight looks less. And we can look at. here also looks less mixed so subject eight we have some concerns but we know that when we looked at the data from earlier the way has subjects eight responded was just weird overall and here's the discrete them probabilities for each of the chains generated these are like I'm not sure how to interpret things like this but that's enough Let's talk through the ja the wind bugs, and then we'll look at the JAGS code, see how it varies, and then we'll talk through some of the exercises here. And I think that's all we'll do today. We'll keep it just uh, limited to the incorporation of the contaminants example ex and the ex um, relevant exercise. So here. We're using for loops where for each subject then, for each of the stimuli uh, in combinations, we're going to model Z as this Bernoulli distribution with some probability of being part of the a trial for a given individual being part of the psychophysiological process or not. And then looks like we then recode. So this is part of just the parameterization strategy where we add plus one because of how it's coded in our data. Rather than ending up being zero one, we're gonna have one zero or one two. So then we're gonna get the theta here for each subject. Ij two. That's interesting. So it's like multi-dimensional here. All oh right. So. IJ2 indicates when the latent indicator is part of the contaminant, potentially contaminant process, then the success rate is just going to be equivalent to pi IJ. However, additionally, then we specify what pi is here, which is a beta uniform beta distribution, so fairly uninformative. Then R which is the duration identified. Or if it's the indicator for if they identified a difference in the intervals. Um, and it's binomially distributed with the probability that we specified above though only for the but uses the theta parameter that corresponds to which indicator that or we get in z and then the number um, depends on number of intervals depends on the subject because this is an adaptive task. Yeah. Once again, then we're doing the, the logit modeling here. So it's just as before, we use this process in order to um, eliminate possible extreme values from the distribution here. And then we get our intercept and slope term here. Mm. 
Now we set some like baseline value for using a probit um, transformation, specifying s what's the baseline probability for being part of one group or another group, and that's phi, and that varies per subject. So the baseline probability uh, of a given trial for an individual uh, being part of the psychophysiological process or some contaminant process is um, on the individual level. So this is a, once again, hierarchical structure where we're going to have some average baseline probability of a given interval for being a given combination of stimuli being a part of the data generating process of interest or some other data generating process of interest. And we'll have some idea of the variability surrounding these estimates baseline estimates of any given trial being a part of uh, the two processes of interest. Um. Okay. And... We're setting like some range restrictions, sort of like what we were doing up here, right? Yeah, it's like a ex elimination of extremes. So in this case, extremes is sort of is just different. And then probe it, phi. So now this is a distribution of probe it phi. are made up, so this is probit fee right here. Probit fee for a given subject is normally distributed with average of the group, fee, lambda. So you use probably uninformative priors for these two. So probit phi is distributed by these parameters and then we use probit phi and we set some limits so we don't get extreme ones and then we fit that to the probit function. So this is the ultimately the phi that we see here that's made up of these two things, right? And then the distributions for beta and alpha are regression parameters and then the, the associated uninformative priors with the necessary retransformations of variables uh, for the sake of interpretation, um, that being the lambdas into sigmas. Um, okay, now that I've ran through the whole model, I'm gonna go and, so my phone alarm is going off and I'm gonna go check that just to get it to stop going off. All right. All right, so we just walked through the graphical model and then the WinBugs code. 
Now I'm just going to move over into the Jax code because there's something interesting going on in there. And I want to talk about it, uh, mostly <laughs> in part because I'm not really sure what it is. But we see these hack, hashtag hack here. So let's see what it says. Here in the script, there's some information that might be useful. So note when monitoring multidimensional variables such as Z here, JAGS requires that they are completely specified. We use a trick here to specify Z to be slightly larger than the maximum and then adjust the model file to add 9999 to the superfluous numbers. This is anything but pretty. So they love different options, but right now it looks like Z has to, ultimately Z has to end up being values that are determined. And so in order to do that, for trials where the interval for a given subject is not representative of the data generating process that we're interested in modeling, we're going to assign 999 to that given trial and thus make it so that it equals the, this process here. If Z is equal to one, but when it talks about this multi dimensional Z is multi dimensional becomes. Right, so let me I think what might also make this easiest to see is let's take a look at what the difference in the text files are for the JAG and not JAG. Doop. I'll do like a flipping back and forth. Doop. So this tells me the flip back and forth. Okay. Wind bugs and JAGs, they're not going to have any distinct differences up top. Or for the generating these distributions for the reparameterizations for the for the parameters that make the logit models however after priors we see we have a little bit of code so do after the code here boom the hack so same thing as what i said before but now for each of the subjects for each of the stimuli find it for all the stimuli go and assign this given tr trial this 999 so the question here is where do I get the values it's whatever is in n stem maybe so let's find what m stem is Or where nstem is and specified. thing about this is uh, and what I'm trying to identify is which of these ZJs, ZIJs, this to me reads like all the ZIJs are going to be assigned 9999. Or does it assign all the ZIJs 999 and then after we do Bayesian inference or after we do the base rule, then the 
credibility for 909 is shifted for trials and, and subjects where it's likely that that particular interval is representative of the psychophysical mu uh, function. So it's not a contaminant, contaminant trial. I just don't see how this parses contaminant trials from non-contaminant trials. So in this script, using the same data that we specified from the first script, same initializations that we specified from the third script, but now we're just interested in a different set of parameters and we're pointing to a different JAGS model specification. J to the number of stimuli to 30. Mm -hmm. so this I'm just trying to figure out how this also doesn't change particular trials that are associated with that are actually associated with the psychophys process. Let's see what the text says. Um, the boxes might be useful too, so I'm going to take a look at the boxes. How did the inclusion of the contaminant process change the inference from the psychophysical function and the key just noticeable differences and point of subjective equality? Let's see. Let's 
Mhm. So we can take a look at, for example, it looks like, okay, here are the same logistic um, or sigmoid curves with the point of equity and then the just noticeable differences identified here at these points on the curve for each of the subjects and we see now um, the white dots are supposed to indicate trials that are part of the psychophys process while the black trials the black dots are supposed to be these that are not part of the process and so for subject four we were able to identify potentially some trials that were part of the process and i'm gonna go and print this again because i'm interested then to know well, why? It looks like we only identified one single trial that fits into our criteria here. And just searching through the subjects. So trial 14 for subject four. It's very much higher. Trial two for subject 20. And we get these 999 trials. And I'm not, I'm not sure what they're supposed to represent. They're just complete exclusions from the data. if you look at okay here's the just noticeable difference curves for each of the subjects for contaminant and non-contaminant models um, which is which let's see if i can find which is which So this is contaminant trials, non-contaminant trials. You see, for many of the subjects, we don't see a big difference in influence of our posterior distributions for just um, noticeable differences for any of the subjects. Though for subject four, we do end up seeing this a substantially larger difference in the um, just noticeable difference posterior distribution where it looked like the subject was more sensitive to differences, uh, smaller differences in the interval stimuli when we included trials that were identified as being part of uh, some contaminant process. Um, though when we account for the potential of there being this contaminant process, we see an increase um, a with respect to the other subjects. I mean, it's a substantial increase in the predicted discern of uh, just noticeable differences or ability to discern differences between the intervals um, of the, the, the stimuli from the experiment.
And so with that, you see in this case, it changed the what we would infer about that particular subject. Um, and building on that. Yeah, so that's like the clearest case where the psychometric function for subject four in this case is distinctly different when we account for, when we choose to account for contaminant processes. But this is only for just noticeable differences. So if we looked at the psychophys curves, we don't see much of a difference here in terms of this point, the point of subjective equity. So that's less variable. But overall, we're not seeing a lot of or substantial um, differences in the estimates that we were getting from across the subjects when we account for these contaminant processes. I guess that's all I really have to say. Let's read along with what this says. Applies. So, I mean, take a look at this plot. Darker squares are supposed to be representative of potentially uh, contaminant trials for a subject. But we didn't really identify that many contaminant. But we did identify one, and we saw how this could impact inference about that particular subject overall. So that would be um, evidence for the demonstrating the importance of incorporating these sorts of um, processes into when modeling uh, psychophysical functions. wonder if we get, what else do we get on the print here that I might be able to look at? Or finish up because I think that we're just going to cut it at that for today. Yeah, so we get the alphas for each subject, with some subjects overall being less likely to detect intervals, and some being more on baseline likely. So really what I'm looking for are instances like this. Probability of it being a contaminant trial. It doesn't look like our range is that sensitive though because it goes, it normally just goes from zero to, to one. So it doesn't look like our data give that much information about potentially identifying. 
Although this is a case where we certainly, and this is, I presume 422 is that trial of that we identified as the black one because there's no other. In fact, of all disease that we've identified other than these 999 cases, which are like irrelevant values. see so what's happening here i get what the 999s are cases where for that particular subject we weren't able to identify a trial at that number in part because of this adaptiveness of the task where some subjects just didn't have 28 trials um and we can prove this here so we looked at all right subject one subject one had 27 trials so if we went and looked at the posterior distribution for Z's uh, for the 28th one, we see it's 999. And part of that is just we didn't observe these values. We need to specify them, um, though we um, these are not uh, particularly informative uh, probabilities. And so this is a way that to mark these trials as being irrelevant, and thus um, we um, shouldn't interpret them. Because they just weren't didn't happen. There's just no data on them. This is good. Now, okay, I figured out the last. That's good. So I figured out the last thing. So four two 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 is the most likely a part of a process that wasn't the psychophys process, and that's why we saw it was black. And then we now have information about what these nine nine nines were and why. You know, in some instances, we're not seeing a lot of black. So this is really the only point we identified that was uh, potentially a part of some other data generating process based on our specification of what uh, would count as some contaminant process. Though, as the little box indicated, you know, there's research in that realm as well. And just as we can model the data of interest using the sigmoid function, so this particular description that we think is most ref uh, mathematical description that we think is most reflective of the data generating process at hand we can also do so for contaminant processes so attentional lapses potentially could be uh, modeled as a contaminant process that can be incorporated into some psychophysical model where we're trying to capture um, some stimulus intensity uh, yeah Nice. So the trick here that they're talking about is just assigning 999 to trials that are irrelevant with irrelevant meaning trials that we fail to observe because the adaptive nature of our tr task. So that's why it makes this code makes more sense now. So we're thinking about it. So go give me the jth interval of the trial and then give me plus one of how many trials that given subject has up to 30. So we know that there's a maximum of 30 trials a subject could have had, and then this plus one to the number of trials that they have is indicating, okay, whichever, whenever that subject runs out of trials, so plus one of that, then assign 999 to them up until the maximum number so that we're not accounting those particular values uh, when we're doing our estimation h up here for all of our parameters. Why do those 999s not impact the data? I'm not sure. I think that's the particular 999 in JAGS makes it so that they're not accounted, maybe. Oh. I don't know. Either way, we've shown that by incorporating a contamination process, some sort of you know, observation uncertainty, we can get more uh, we can get better predictions for the psychophysical f uh, processes that we're interested in modeling um, because we're accounting for potentially trials not being a part of not being a part of the process we're interested in modeling so not all information we gather is equal, right? Cool. So th I think that covers f enough 
for today. It was a very interesting example. Uh, tomorrow we're going to move into extrasensory perception, which is a, a, a classic set of studies that um, in the replication world really actually spoke fire to our current what's called replication crisis in psychology. So I think that this chapter is going to discuss some of Bem's work, and I'm already seeing Bem's name, but um, I think Wagemacher was actually one of the individuals who went about doing some of the replication work here, um, demonstrating the mm, improbability or the ridiculousness, really, of this idea of precognition, which it looks like we're going to talk about more tomorrow. And yeah, I look forward to talking through th this example and then um, identifying potentially some useful uh, things we need to consider when we're doing Bayesian inference. Mm. Uh, cool. It looks like a pretty involved chapter. Nice. Okay. I'm excited then. All right. So I'll we'll chat tomorrow then. This was a, a great, nice little late night session. Um, uh, it's new. I normally try to do these in like the middle of the day, but this just it ended up only being able to land here based on what was my schedule was going on today. So I, I hope you enjoyed the the late night coding. I was a little more. Um, laid back maybe uh, that's my nice way of describing a little tired but uh, nonetheless we go through and we'll, we'll try every day so thanks for sticking around today and have a great night and i'll catch you guys